welcome to episode 52 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folk Tales. My name is Mylan the Bible, and today we hear how Feng murders his brother, marries his wife, and how Amleth feigns madness in part one of Amleth, Prince of Denmark. King Rorik, son of Hotur, made joint governors of Jutland two brothers, whose names were Horvendal and Feng. Their father, Gervendal, was governor before them. Horvendal was chief ruler, but he sought for glory as a sea rover. King Kull of Norway was also ambitious for ocean renown, and he longed to battle with the ships of Horvendal. The rivals met together at an island in the midst of the sea, which they each desired to possess. A young Horvendal challenged Kull to fight a duel. Thus it came that the two men contended one against the other on a portion of spring green sward. Horvendal was the bolder and more daring of the two. He flung aside his shield and grasped his sword with both hands. Furious attack did he make upon the king of Norway, whose shield he split in twain. Then he inflicted wounds and smote off Cole's foot, so that he sank in death before the valorous young hero. But Horvendal honored the sea king with stately burial and caused to be erected a great grave mound so that his memory might endure forever. Many triumphs did Horvendal afterwards achieve, and to his king he gave gifts of the spoils of battle. So became he a hero in the kingdom. Rorik, who exalted Horvendal with honors and made him king of Jutland, gave his daughter a princess, Geruta, that to that renowned sea, <clears throat> gave his daughter the princess Geruta to that renowned sea rover to be his wife. To them was a son born whose name was Amleth. Horvendal's good fortune stung his brother Feng with jealousy, so that the latter resolved treacherously to waylay his brother, thus showing that goodness is not safe, even from those of a man's own house. And behold, when a chance came to murder him, his bloody hand sated the deadly passion of his soul. Then he took his wife of the brother he had butchered, capping unnatural murder with incest, for whoso yields to one iniquity speedily falls on easier victim to the next, the first being an incentive to the second. Also the man veiled the monstrosity of his deed with such hardihood of cunning that he made a mock pretense of good will to excuse his crime and glossed over fratricide with a show of righteousness. Geruta said he, though so gentle that she would to no man the slightest hurt, had been visited with her husband's extremest hate, and it was all to save her that he had slain his brother, for he thought it shameful that a lady so meek and unrancorous should suffer the heavy disdain of her husband. Nor did his smooth words fail in their intent, for at courts, where fools are sometimes favored and backbiters preferred, a lie lacks no credit. Nor did Feng keep from shameful embraces the hands that had slain a brother, pursuing with equal guilt both of his wicked and impious deeds. Amleth beheld all this, but feared lest too shrewd a behavior might make his uncle suspect him. So he chose to feign dullness and pretend an utter lack of wits. This cunning course not only concealed his intelligence, but ensured his safety. Every day he remained in his mother's house, utterly listless and unclean, flinging himself on the ground and bespattering his person with foul and filthy dirt. His discolored face and visage smudged with slime denoted foolishness and grotesque madness. All he said was a piece with these follies, 
all he did savoured of utter lethargy. In a word, you would not have thought him a man at all, but some absurd abortion due to a mad fit of destiny. He used at times to sit over the fire, raking up the embers with his hands to fashion wooden crooks and harden them in the fire, shaping at their tips certain barbs to make them hold more tightly to their fastenings. When asked when he was about, he said that he was preparing sharp javelins to avenge his father. This answer was not a little scoffed at, all men deriding his idle and ridiculous pursuit, but the thing helped his purpose afterwards. Now, it was his craft in this matter that first awakened in the deeper observers a suspicion of his cunning, for his skill in a trifling art betokened the hidden talent of the craftsman nor could they believe the spirit dull where the hand had acquired so cunning a workmanship. Lastly, he always watched with the most punctual care over his pile of stakes that he had pointed in the fire. Some people, therefore, declared that his mind was quick enough and fancied that he only played the simpleton in order to hide his understanding and veiled some deep purpose under a cunning feint. His wiliness, said these, would be most readily detected if a fair woman were put in his way in some secluded place, who would provoke his mind to the temptations of love, all man's natural temper being too blindly amorous to be artfully dissembled, and this passion being also too impetuous to be checked by cunning. Therefore, if his lethargy were feigned, he would seize the opportunity and yield straightway to violent delights. Some men were commissioned to draw the young man and his rides into a remote part of the forest, and there assail him with a temptation of this nature. Among these chanced to be a forest brother of Amleth, who had not ceased to have regard to their common nurture, and who esteemed his present orders less than the memory of their past fellowship. He attended Amleth among his appointed train, being anxious not to entrap, but to warn him, and was persuaded that he would suffer the worst if he showed the slightest glimpse of sound reason, and above all, if he did act of love openly. This was also plain enough to Amleth himself. For when he was bidden mount his horse, he deliberately set himself in such a fashion that he turned his back to the neck and faced about, fronting the tail, which he proceeded to encompass with the reins, just as if on that side he would check the horse in its furious pace. By this cunning thought he eluded the trick and overcame the treachery of his uncle. The reinless steed galloping on with the rider directing its tail was ludicrous enough to behold. Amleth went on, and a wolf crossed his path amid the thicket. When his companions told him that a young colt had met him, he retorted that in Fang stood there were too few of that kind fighting. This was a gentle but a witty fashion of invoking a curse upon his uncle's riches. When they averred that he had given a cunning answer, he answered that he had spoken deliberately, for he was loath to be thought prone to lying about any matter, and wished to be held a stranger to falsehood, and accordingly he mingled craft and candor in such wise that, though his words did lack truth, yet there was nothing to betoken the truth and betray how far his keenness went. Again, as he passed along the beach, his companions found the rudder of a ship, which had been wrecked, and they said that they had discovered a huge knife. This, said he, was the right thing to carve a huge ham, by which he really meant the sea to whose infantude he thought this enormous rudder matched. Also, as they passed the sand hills and bade him look at the meal, meaning the sand, he replied that it had been ground small by the hoary tempest of the ocean. His companions, praising his answer, he said that he had spoken it wittingly. Then they purposely left him that he might pluck up more courage to practice wantonness. 
The woman whom his uncle had dispatched met him in a dark spot, as though she had crossed him by chance. And he took her and would have ravished her had not his foster brother, by a secret device, given him an inkling of the trap. For this man, while pondering the fittest way to play privily the prompter's part, and forestall the young man's hazarded lewdness, found a straw on the ground and fastened it underneath the tail of a gadfly that was flying past, which he then drove towards the particular quarter which he knew Amleth to be, an act which served the unwary price exceedingly well. The token was interpreted as shrewdly as it had been sent, for Amleth saw the gadfly, espied with curiosity the straw which it wore embedded in its tail, and perceived that it was a secret warning to beware of treachery. Alarmed, scenting a trap, and fain to possess his desire in greater safety, he caught up the woman in his arms and dragged her off to a distant and impenetrable fen. Moreover, when they had lain together, he conjured her earnestly to disclose the matter to none, and the promise of silence was accorded as heartily as it was asked. For both of them had been under the same fostering in their childhood, and this early rearing in common had brought Amleth and the girl into greater intimacy. So, when he had returned home, they all jeeringly asked him whether he had been given way to love, and he had vowed that he had ravished the maiden. When he was asked where he did it, and what had been his pillow, he said that he had rested upon the hoof of a beast of burden, upon a coxcomb, and also upon a ceiling. For when he was started into temptation, he had gathered fragments of all these things in order to avoid lying. And though his jest did not take aught of the truth out of the story, the answer was greeting with shouts of merriment from the bystanders. The maiden, too, when questioned on the matter, declared that he had done no such thing, and her denial was the more readily credited when it was found that the escort had not witnessed the deed. Then he, who had marked the gadfly in order to give him a hint, wishing to show Amleth that to his trick he owed his salvation, observed that latterly he had been singly devoted to Amleth. The young man's reply was apt not to seem forgetful of his informant's service. He said that he had seen a certain thing bearing a straw flit by suddenly wearing a stalk of chaff fixed on its hinder parts. The cleverness of this speech, which made the rest split with laughter, rejoiced the heart of Amleth's friend. Thus, all were worsted, and none could open the secret lock of the young man's wisdom. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.